Hello and welcome everyone to Oceanside Library's online program, Teen Impact Insight Driving with Oceanside Safe Coalition, um, Mount Sinai South Nassau Hospital, and now our presenters will be Allison Anderson and Allison Erickson. Take it away, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akaria. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Very good. Good. Just making sure. So welcome to our presentation tonight. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Oceanside Library for hosting us on your virtual platform. Uh, my name is Allison Erickson, and I'll be presenting tonight along with Allison Anderson. Uh, both of us are representatives of Oceanside Safe Coalition, and Allison Anderson is um, a registered nurse over at Mount Sinai South Nassau Hospital. Uh, so we have a great presentation for you tonight. Again, thank you for being here. Uh, so we're going to get started here with our Teen Impact Insight Driving. So for uh, Impact uh, Insight Driving, today's webinar is mostly based on the teaching of Impact Teen Drivers. So this is an organization that develops, promotes, and facilitates evidence-based education to save lives, prevent crashes, and ultimately to stop the number of the number one killer of teens, and that's reckless and distracted driving. So Impact uh, Insight Driving does this by partnering and training individuals with state agencies, first responders, healthcare organizations, educators, and community partners. So they help spread the message of safe driving to achieve real impact in communities throughout the United States. You're also gonna be hearing information from the Oceanside Safe Coalition as it relates to the culture of substance use among teens in Oceanside. So Oceanside Safe Coalition has uh, been formed since 2015. We are a newly funded drug-free communities program under the fiscal agent of Long Beach Coalition for Underage Drinking. Our mission is to prevent and reduce alcohol and drug use among youth by engaging in environmental strategies, programs, and activities that create a safe, healthy, and drug-free Oceanside community. So today's presenters, you're gonna be hearing from Allison Anderson. She's a trained healthcare representative in the teachings of Impact Insight. She is the Trauma Injury Prevention Coordinator for the Department of Surgery and Trauma at Mount Sinai South Nassau's Community Hospital. And she is the healthcare sector representative for Oceanside Safe Coalition. I'm Allison Erickson. I am a licensed social worker and the project coordinator for Oceanside Safe Coalition. I am also the co-founder of the Makeshift Movement. So I'm going to start off today by discussing um, the culture and of substance use among youth within Oceanside. So it's important first to get an idea of the local conditions as they attribute to Oceanside itself, and that's supported by qualitative and quali quantitative data. So back in 2019, a youth development survey was conducted by the coalition, which represented about 85% of Oceanside youth from grades 7 to 12. Uh, different categories were assessed to, to determine the core measures of substance use. And according to the responses, there were two substances that were most prevalent for use among Oceanside youth, and that was alcohol and marijuana. So you'll see on the graph right here, it represents uh, past 30 day use that alcohol did seem to have a steady increase here from ninth to, to 12th grade. And then uh, marijuana seemed to have its highest number of use at 11th grade uh, with 28.6% of students. Now alcohol for um, 11th grade, uh, you have 48.8% and 58.1%. Um, the data from the uh, from Oceanside youth for alcohol use is actually above the state average. So you've got 48% and 58% and the state average is actually 31.63%. So that's very concerning. Additional data that's not shown here um, actually showed that from grades 7 to 12, that 3.8% of youth did report driving under the influence of alcohol and 8.6% reported driving under the influence of marijuana. From grades 7 to 12, 13.8% of students reported being in a situation that they regretted due to alcohol and 13.9% reported that they forgot what happened after drinking alcohol. So that does raise concern in regard to decision making and overall safety. So if this is the, again, this is prior to COVID. So if all of this was happening prior to COVID and this is the data that we're looking at in terms of youth usage, 
what do we kind of have to be looking at now with all of the environmental changes that COVID has brought to us? So shift in norms, uh, with the new environment of stressors that COVID has brought on, we've had quarantine, we've had riots, we've had cancellations of big events. The normalization of underage drinking and using alcohol as a coping technique has risen as a, as a consequence here. According to the Nielsen online, alcohol sales in the United States have skyrocketed 477% since the beginning of quarantine. So we have families that are stressed, right? Parents are out of jobs, they're homeschooling, everyone's trying to hold it all together while normative schedules and routines are just completely out the window. So society began drinking earlier, more frequently. Uh, there's more alcohol available in the house. There's that we deserve it quarantine um, idea for getting through the day. But really what we want to get across here is what message does this send to our youth? So I'm not sure if anybody uh, watches Saturday Night Live or if you've seen this skit before, I will not show the whole thing, but I just wanted to kind of give it as an idea of what society is really, the, the message that's being presented to our youth. Um, so I'm gonna show a little video here. And again, this is very much satire humor, but a lot of people were very upset by this sketch. So take a look if you haven't seen just to get the idea. Oops, sorry, let me go back here. Give it a play. Oh my God. When things get tough, we pull ourselves by our bootstraps. Obviously after the ad. So just to come back from that, um, According, according to our data, just to get back into that, underage drinking pre-COVID, this was already seen as a part of growing up, an acceptable part of growing up. So we had 32% of respondents from a, um, a community survey that we put together who did feel like it was uh, somewhat acceptable and felt it was a normal part of growing up. So just to take note of the changing environment, the shift in norms, it is important that we as a community that we do stay alert to what type of message is being sent to teens. Um, if they're more likely to be engaging in the risky behavior before they get behind the wheel of a car, the combination of this along with this reopening of Long Island, teens are itching to get out. They're, they're itching to get out there. They're itching to do you know, more getting out of quarantine. So we don't want this to have dire consequences, obviously. Okay. So if we look back to recent history, Tra traumatic events uh, have historically led to spikes in alcohol abuse and independence, and, and, dependence, um, and an uptick in DUIs. So according to our own fourth precinct, since April, there has been a steady increase in DWIs, especially since the reopening of restaurants. Um, this was also the case after 9-11 and natural disasters such as Hurricane Sandy. Data from our neighboring coalitions showed a spike in alcohol abuse um, and DUIs post Superstorm Sandy. So what's the difference with now, with COVID? The period of social distancing and the effects that it has already had or will continue to have on our youth, it has no end. We don't know when this is over. So what are we expecting to see as a result? How drastic will it be? And how are we as a community gonna change the culture of underage drinking in Oceanside? So it's encouraged that we as adults and role models, we take this time to kind of consider the severity of our own use as well. How are we coping? How has COVID impacted our own drinking habits, if at all? You should ask yourself, have I been drinking more than usual? What type of language have I been using around my child as it pertains to drinking and coping with what's going on in the world? So heavy alcohol use is defined as more than four drinks on any day for men or more than three drinks for women, according to the National Institute on alcohol abuse and alcoholism. So watch for signs that drinking is interfering with emotional stability, spikes in irritability, anxiety, and depression in yourself and your teen. If you're concerned about your own increase in alcohol intake, um, most local pediatricians or physicians, they are trained in drug and alcohol screening and they can help you identify if there are reasons for concern uh, linked to drinking at this time. 
So it's never too soon. It's never too soon to educate your teens on the dangers of distracted driving and the impairing effects of alcohol and other substances. But just remember that actions speak louder than words. Model good behavior, talk with your teens early and often, remain clear and consistent, and try to avoid messages that glorify or promote substance use in a good way. Try to convey your individual expectations and set your appropriate boundaries. Um, you can use resources like signing contracts for safe driving, what to do in uncomfortable situations, who to call, how to respond. Uh, if you're wondering how to have that first conversation about it or just simply having your next conversation, segueing it into the topic of safe driving is a good way to do that because they really do coincide with each other. Um, definitely visit our website. So we're at www.oceansidesafe.org. We have so many resources on how to have these talks. There's tips for every age. Our social media handles are available um, on our website so you can follow us. We post new resources, articles, and helpful prevention tools regularly. Uh, we are still having virtual meetings every month. So we do encourage you to, to join us. Get in touch with us. Contact us on our website. Let us know if you're interested in being a part of Oceanside Safe Coalition. We need your voice at our table because the only way to actually have sustaining change as it pertains to underage drinking and substance use with youth in Oceanside is to do it as a community. So that wraps up my portion. I'm actually going to pass it over to Allison Anderson now and she's going to get more into the topic of distracted driving and teach you a little bit more uh, on that topic. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and thank you for your time. And Allison can go. Yes, I'm making Allison co-host right now. Go ahead, Allison, you could share your screen. All right. One second. Okay, can everyone see? Yes. So, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Allie, for the segue into my program. So, um, if at any point you can't hear me, just please let me know. So, um, as Allie said, I'm a, I'm a registered nurse at Mount Sinai South Nassau in Oceanside. So, in uh, Oceanside Safe's own backyard. Uh, we are a level two adult trauma center. So, that's 18 years and older. And the reason that I teach this distracted driving program is simply because my job is to teach evidence-based programs based on our top three mechanisms of trauma. So motor vehicle crashes are number two, falls are number one, and then pedestrians being struck are number three. So I've taught this pre-COVID. Uh, I was teaching this within Oceanside School District to so all the health classes in the high school, uh, as well as a few other school districts around the area. So I do thank you all for taking the time to speak, uh, to listen to me today, because this really is an important topic, especially with COVID now and the statistics that Ali gave um, with the, the underage drinking. And again, it kind of flows into this because uh, if your teens are not driving yet, uh, if they're or if they're just beginning, they're not experienced. Um, maybe they're just starting some classes, maybe you're just starting to teach them, but the world is very different right now. And just as your kids emulate you as a, <clears throat> you know, emulate their parents with underage drinking, the same goes for driving habits. So the studies uh, do show the significant impact on parental involvement and um, being a positive reinforcement for your teen driver. So essentially, bottom line is that age 18 and 19 years old in the US, and um, these are evidence-based CDC statistics, that um, reckless and distracted driving is the number one killer of teens age 18 to 19. So, and again, to reiterate uh, the importance right in Oceanside, it's our number two mechanism of trauma. So in ages 18 and older. So just uh, before I start this uh, program, I like to give this fact. It's, it's one of, I think, the most impactful statements that I learned when training for this program to be a, a, a teacher for it. Um, I trained in Albany a few years ago, and this statement really stood out to me. If you close your eyes for three seconds while driving 65 miles an hour, so picture the southern state, right, or the Meadowbrook, that equals driving the length of a football field, which is 100 yards. 65 miles an hour, 
close your eyes for three seconds, you've driven a football field. Imagine the damage that can occur at that speed with how many other people are on the road, where we live. So this program really um, kind of hits home to me. It's very emotional, um, especially as a parent myself now. So I really hope that you all enjoy it and do take something from it. So with that introduction. So when I go into the classrooms, the students do not know why I'm there. All they see are these posters. So we ask teens, what do you consider most lethal? So when this program was first developed, the uh, founder, she, Kelly Brown, she, she polled US teens and she asked them, these were their top answers. What do you consider most lethal, most deadly? These were teenagers' answers, high school students' answers, 18, 19 year olds, so high school seniors and college freshmen. So in the classroom, I say, what, why do you think these are lethal? What makes, you know, grizzlies lethal? Oh, well, they can attack people. What makes crack lethal? Oh, well, you can, you know, die from usage. What makes lip gloss lethal? And I think one of the best answers, and actually, again, this was pre-COVID, one girl raised her hand in the health class and she said, well, you can, you can share germs and you can get an infection if your friend has one. So if you share lip gloss, you know, you can, you can die. So it was a good, good thinking. But turns out, all of these statistics, the answer is because the bottom ones, lip gloss, texting, and lattes, they're all distractions with driving. The three above them on each one, uh, I'm sorry, the four above them, the first four on each poster, are less deadly in teenagers than the bottom three. So, if you look at it, you have a higher chance of getting killed because of lip gloss while driving distracted than you do getting killed by a grizzly bear. So you can kind of see where it's going. So then they start to say, okay, okay, you know, what's, what's going on? Like, what are, what are we really here for? What are you going to talk to us about? So why, why do we show this? Because when you have your hands off the wheel and your eyes off the road, you aren't concentrating. You're choosing to put on lip gloss, you're choosing to text, you're choosing to grab your latte. And all those things put your risk of a car crash, whether minor or fatal, you know, puts you at higher risk. So applying um, and applying makeup or shaving while driving increases your chance of crashing by about three times. And each passenger, each teen passenger, increases the risk of a teen driver crash with two or more passengers, peer passengers, so not adults, peer passengers, tripling the risk. So little, little things like lip gloss, texting, and lattes while driving can be more deadly than all of the others in this specific teenage group. Ooh, I'm sorry. So this is this is a a, a video. It's a ten minute video, um, but it really kind of sets the tone for the program and what it's all about. So this is really um, where the insight of the program comes through, and uh, where you really start to get an understanding for how serious uh, reckless and distracted driving, as silly as it might seem, and think little things that you do as a parent while driving your teens around or your kids around, they are watching everything you do. So that's why this, this program really, really is emotional and does hit home. So here we go. Something that kills you or somebody around you. Falling from a building. Skydiving without a parachute. Maybe a stampede. Untied shoes. Monkeys. Ninjas for sure. The mafia. Bad takeout. Somebody with a samurai sword trying to chop somebody's head off. A bobcat? Oh, a bad dad joke is very deadly. So what do you consider lethal? For most, it's either the dangers they sense immediately around them, or it's based on an experience they had. We asked random people what they thought was the number one killer of teens in America. Here's what they said. I want to say drunk driving. Drunk driving. Yeah. Sex, drugs, and alcohol. Possibly drug overdose? Drugs. Cigarettes? Drinking. Online dating. The number one killer of teens in America is something we've all participated in. 
reckless and distracted driving. We have all seen someone send a text while driving, post a picture, dig through a bag, or turn to talk to friends, all while supposedly keeping their eyes on the road. So, for the next few minutes, we want to show you the lives that have been shattered by reckless and distracted driving, and the simple things that you can do to avoid becoming a statistic. Nuba police say they now have a prime example of the damage distracted driving can cause. A Central California teenager is behind bars after a car crash that killed her younger sister. Live on Instagram while driving, her younger sister was killed. The crash was all recorded, and this is a distracted driver. There were two minors in the car, and they were not wearing seatbelts. A light vigil to remember Christine Martinez, who was just 17 years old when she was killed in that crash. The 18 year old Summer Solomon was behind the wheel when she lost control. The car rolling three times. Martinez ejected from the vehicle. Through tears and candlelight, they gathered, united in their grief, mourning a young life cut short. She was always so happy on the field. Loved ones say the losses are devastating. <laughs> So what is reckless and distracted driving? Distracted driving is any time you have to take your eyes off the road, your hands off the wheel, or when your mind is not focused on driving for any reason. And reckless driving is speeding and acting like a total fool. Now for the simple part. How do we keep from needlessly dying in a car crash? That's easy. First, tell your friends that as much as you love them to sit down and be quiet. Second, realize that you decrease the risk of crashing your car by 2,000% when you don't text and drive. Third, come to terms with the fact that you might have to wake up a few minutes earlier so you're not speeding or running stop signs while putting your life and the life of others at risk. Still not exactly sure what reckless and distracted driving is? Let's see what our resident experts have to say. <laughs> Oh, it's on? Oh, hi, my name is Lance. Oh, and I'm Hayden. And we're here to help you save lives. Like mine. Distracted driving is deadly. Better than my grandpa's fart. Gross, dude. Ew. And gross, like, all you kissy face kids that drive. You boys are like, hey, baby, give me a kiss. And you girls like, oh, you're so hot. I give you all the kisses in the world. Besides being nasty, you're not looking at the road. It looks like you eat in the car. You drink in one hand and a burger in the other. And think you could steal your knees? You ain't Spider-Man. Do you really want your last meal to be off the dollar menu? And last but not least, your phones. It doesn't matter if you're driving hands-free, but when you're on it, you're driving brain-free. And taking pictures of yourself and texting your friends? That's stupid. Lex. No name-calling. No matter how lame driving with your phone in the car is. Sorry. Not sorry. Well, a lot of you should be sorry. Seriously. You gotta cut the distracted driving. Put two hands on the wheel, eyes on the road, and your brain focused. The reason this is so important to me is that I recently lost my 19-year-old cousin, Christian, in a crash that was completely avoidable. And I miss him every day. Let's see what's so distracting. What? what? Texting. Texting. I like to dance when I drive. Car dancing. Mm-hmm. Phones. Trying to find the right song. <laughs> Reading a book. Food. I get distracted by directions a yeah. lot. Talking to friends. <laughs> doing makeup. I admittedly have changed and drove before. I tried to write a paper on my laptop while I was driving. What we often hear from victims is that they never thought it would happen to them that their son, daughter, friend, or classmate could be involved in a fatal car crash. And no one could imagine causing such a tragic event. Let me tell you about Donovan. He was my teammate. He was my son. He was a classmate. He was my best friend. He was my boyfriend. My son was my baby boy. I met Donovan in about 8th grade, and we just 
immediately became friends. We just connected. And I came here before my freshman year, and he was the first person that actually like talked to me. Looking at how he interacted with others, it was something that made me proud. Donovan was definitely a people person. He uh, attracted all kinds. I was playing line, and he was the running back, and uh, I led block him all the way for a touchdown. And ever since then, we just became good friends. I see him as the leader of the pack. He would not only lead by example, but also try to help others sort through whatever they were going through in their own lives. A day I'll never forget. Life is, I knew it, ended forever. And then we were driving home. We were just kids having fun. I was going over the speed limit excessively. And we were blaring the music up really loud. And I noticed that we were going pretty fast. And it was causing the car to swerve back and forth. And we were like making fun of her, telling her, like, can't you keep the car like in a straight line? My response was, oh, like this? And I drove the wheel back and forth. forth. I remember like all the sounds of like the car crashing. I looked around and I see Donovan, but he wasn't moving. So I sat with Danica, I kept telling her, like, Donovan's dead. Donovan's dead. I even remember calling out Donovan's name and, you know, hoping that he would hear me and just get up. The Madera Ranchos community is mourning the death of a teenager killed in a car crash early this morning. Not my son. Not my boy. And I think that was one of the most painful things to experience was hearing a mother cry about her son. The screaming of a mother just now finding out that her son is dead. And all simply because of something that was so preventable. My life was shattered by distracted driving. The decisions made by everyone in the car, including Donovan, are what's responsible for his death. Were they bad kids? No. Did they make bad decisions? Absolutely. And my son Donovan, he knew to always wear his seatbelt. But why that night did he choose not to? I'll ask myself that question for the rest of my life. So why does my family choose to share our worst moment? Because we want each of you to remember that every time you get in a vehicle, you have to make good choices. Otherwise, it could be the last choice you make, as it was for my son, Donovan. So we've heard the compelling stories. We've seen the stats, and you understand the simplicity of the message. What is most lethal to young people is making poor choices in a car. The good news is that we have the power to change and stop the number one killer of young people in America. When you are behind the wheel, focus on the road ahead of you and make good decisions each and every ride. If you're a passenger, don't distract the driver and everyone gets to where they're going safely. Finally, visit whatslethal.com. Together, we can save lives. My apologies. Okay. Can you all hear me? I hope you can all hear me. Okay. <clears throat> So that is, again, a very uh, emotional movie. I've showed it to my family. Um, I showed it to my friends. It, is, it definitely tugs at the heartstrings. Um, and I, one thing that some people I've learned over time, they don't know really what the term ejected means. Um, ejected means that more often than not, when no seatbelt is worn from the, the speed, so like the velocity, 
and the between the velocity and the impact the passenger or the person in the car the driver whomever it is is literally thrown projected through the front windshield more often than not so that that truly happens and it's awful and nobody nobody wants to hear that that happened to anyone so um but this is this is donovan and the important thing about this whole program specifically with this uh, is that this had nothing to do with drugs or alcohol uh there's a whole backstory behind this and they were they were good kids they were actually coming home from the movies um so there there was nothing nothing um you know illicit really going on besides distracted driving and just as you can see plainly on the screen car crashes are 100 percent preventable so um this is kind of an example this kind of puts it into perspective in a picture uh the each each uh dot that makes up the poster each color represents a different uh mechanism of injury or or mechanism that led to death so the white are distracted driving or car crashes reckless and distracted driving so the white make up the bulk of the poster as you can see the others um, that do not even come close to car crashes combined include um, other uh, injury related death suicide um, murder illness etc so just think about that and and this is a powerful statement think about all the people behind each dot their family their friends their classmates community you can see from the video that donovan donovan's entire family friends girlfriend it it lives on through other people for the rest of their lives too something that is so preventable so as you heard uh for over 400,000 teens are seriously injured you can find those stats on the cdc website um 50 percent 50 to 60 percent actually of all driving fatalities are the passenger uh and 75 percent of crashes do not involve alcohol or drugs and 50 percent of the people who died last year would be alive today if they had chosen to buckle up so i just want to touch on this real quick so this is a wheel when we're in the classroom uh the if you can see on the top the yellow is uh daytime the red is nighttime so i give these to the students they pass them around so essentially your it it shows your risk uh with each distraction and how each distraction that adds up can lead to um an increased risk of a crash <clears throat> excuse me so it's just a tool to engage the statistics associated with reckless and distractive driving um uh, basically um you choose the color, you add it up. So whether you have zero passengers to three passengers, day or night, if you're uh, grabbing something, music, cell phone, texting, and as you can see, the only way that you can have a 0% probability of getting into a crash is no passengers, no distractions, daytime driving. So graduated driver's licensing, um, I'll touch on this very briefly. This is something that as a parent, this really is um, your responsibility or the guardian, whomever uh, is the one kind of overseeing the, the, per, the drivers, the new, the new driver's education and practice. Um, driving is uh, a privilege and every single state in the United States has, you know has these guidelines gdls for a reason so the reason being because you can see really quick so no passengers one passenger as each number of passengers increases the passengers specifically under the age of 21 the risk goes up you have less of a chance of getting into a fatal crash if your passenger if you have one passenger over the age of 35 so this these are all statistics that led to this uh, impact teen driver program being made and as you can see uh between the hours of 9 and 1 9 p.m and 1 a.m uh the most crashes occur why is that weekday uh because if you think about it as an adult as well nighttime you know your vision isn't as great as you get older 
but in general, your visit vision is not as great uh, when when you're driving at night. So that in itself puts you at risk. So those are generally uh, the highest times that uh, the fatalities occur. So the reason that there are uh, GDL laws after different studies were done throughout all the different states in the country, um, they really, they showed that it increases uh, teen fatalities and car crashes by 40 to 60 percent. That is very significant. So every state has different GDL laws. So as the, as um, the, again, parent or guardian, you, this is your responsibility. This is your job, just like the, the, teen's job is to take it seriously and and know the laws of the road and not just take a written test and then think they know everything and go driving um, as a parent or a guardian it's your job to oversee them to to give them the privilege you know as they show the responsibility and remember that they emulate everything that you do so what they think is normal might be illegal so uh, they, they might not know that, you know, shaving or doing your hair or makeup or, um, you know, talking even hands-free in some places, you know, you, you have to be really um, cognizant of when you have other people in the car who are, you know, very vulnerable to, to learning poor habits and ones that can really get them into trouble one day. So as you can see, it's not about age, it's about um, the experience. So just because you get your license at 16 doesn't mean, you know, by 18 that you're, you're this professional driver um, or vice versa. So um, for example, I know a few people in their 30s who, who got their license in their 30s and they're not the greatest drivers just because they're in their 30s. So. Um, you practice, 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 as in anything. You want to, you want to get good at it. You want to get, um, you know, you want to drill it into your brain. You want to be comfortable at it. Practice, and as the parent or guardian, practice with them. Show them, show them the right way to do it. Because, as my parents always said when I was younger, and I'd ask, well, why do I have to be home early? Why do I have to have a curfew? Because my parents always said it wasn't me they were worried about. I could be the most careful driver in the world, but it was other people. And these other people are 18 and 19 year olds who are novice drivers and who think they're invincible and maybe have some you know, negative influences while they're in the vehicle. So you really need to think about these things um, because they all, they all are little things that add up to this huge problem. So especially now in the COVID era. So this is, um, this is another video. Uh, I chose this one. This is a quick one. I chose this one because um, it's very relevant with texting. Um, again, those three seconds that you look down, say you're on the, one of our highways here and the speed limit is 65 and you're going the speed limit, but you look down for those three seconds just to look, you've gone the length of a football field and hopefully there's nobody around you and that you're you're capable of you know responding and it's um it, it's a very scary thing to think about but it's very real and we do see it at our trauma center uh almost on a daily basis so i'm gonna go ahead and play this and then we'll be done shortly i remember people texting me and saying like do you hear what what happened to Sydney? Is it true? Like, I checked Facebook and all of a sudden there's all these like, I love you Sydney, RIPs, and I'm like, what? So I tried calling her, she didn't answer. I tried calling her mom, her mom didn't answer. And then finally I drove her to her house and she wasn't there. It was horrible. She was the most amazing person that I've ever met. She was never like that person to like put people in a bad mood. She was always trying to put people in a good mood. She was one of the best people I know. Her heart was so big. I've never met anybody with a heart as big as hers. Uh, we were working on building a tree house in our backyard and uh, Sydney very much uh, wanted to be involved and help out. And you know, I'm up on the ladder uh, trying to shingle the tree house and I'm a little nervous being up there. And Sydney climbs up and she's laying across the roof, uh, nailing shingles and she didn't have any fear. 
She helped us build our treehouse room. And I remember um, seeing her out her windows in the backyard on top of the roof, hitting in nails. And that a piece of Sydney that was very unique to her, I think, versus other teenagers, is she still had a very big kid heart. She was a girl that liked to play, and she liked to ride swings with me. We had talked about going to the pumpkin festival, and I told her that I wanted to go. And she was like, yeah, I want to go too. She runs down the steps, she's got her bag, and she's like, okay, I'm going to Vicky's house, love you, see you tomorrow. I said, okay, not knowing that was going to be The last time she ever spoke to me. That night they were heading back from a pumpkin uh, farm, and they were heading down the highway, and um, Joe, the passenger, was looking at his cell phone, and he felt the car jerk. It hit on the other side of the grassy median and flipped the car over. I was very close to hitting the car myself, so I kind of closed my eyes. I think it slammed on my brakes, and that's whenever I got out of the car and, and saw Joseph jump right out. Um, and I realized that he was searching for Sydney, so um, that's when I started helping him look for her, and I, I saw Sydney in the ditch. At that point, still didn't really have a full grasp of what happened. I just knew that it was a vehicle that crossed the median or whatever, and somebody had been injected, which me immediately being um, uh, able to say is that the seatbelt wasn't born in the case. I started calling hospital after a hospital until finally they answered and told me that she was there. We were using medications for her blood pressure to keep her heart beating. Um, we were using the ventilator to keep her breathing. We finally made it to the emergency room and when the highway patrol people showed up and he said she was ejected from the vehicle, she wasn't wearing her seatbelt. <laughs> I thought, why? Why did she have it on? And then the, the ER doctor comes in and he's like, she's very, very sick. She hit her head and we're going to try to take the swelling down. But where she was hit, it's, it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to do anything for her. And then her mom answered the phone at the hospital and told me to come up because she wasn't going to make it and to come say goodbye. We knew the whole time that we were at the hospital that we were going to have to have a conversation with our kids and let them know that she's not coming home. And it was, it was almost like hear, hearing it again because you're experiencing their brand new grief. I started crying and I was like crying against my mom and hugging her. We miss her tremendously. Uh, we keep her in our conversations on a daily basis. She's still a very integral part of our lives, even though she's not here. I miss having fun with her. I miss um, being friends with her and playing elephants and a lot of stuff like that. Um, there was still a lot of unanswered questions of why. A bunch of cops like came over and started like asking me a bunch of questions like, where were you going, what happened, why did you swerve off the road? And I was just like, I saw that when we were going off the road, she like threw her phone. Start putting everything together and realizing that this is a texting and driving crash. Um, we were able to specifically say it was texting and not anything else. Learning from this for Sydney, you know, because it affected us as healthcare workers, it affected us as people, it affected us um, as mothers and aunts and cousins and sisters. This is something that isn't just uh, going to affect you. This is something that so, it's so formidable. I mean, these kids don't need to be so distracted. There's nothing that's important enough that's going to cause you to lose your life. There's not a single thing important enough. For some reason, she made a bad decision that day. She clearly was touching her phone, and whether it was texting or looking at something on her phone, uh, that caused the accident. And she also made a bad decision not to wear her seatbelt. That's caused her death. Joe was a front passenger in the car. He was wearing his seatbelt. Um, he walked away from the collision. Vicki was a passenger in the rear seat. Uh, she had the lap belt on, but she had the shoulder belt behind her back. I broke my arm. I broke my neck. 
and I broke my back. For the longest time, I blamed that whole thing on myself. Like, I could have stopped that if I was not on my phone texting my mom. I don't remember the accident. I don't remember what had happened. I was sorry that I didn't get to tell her bye or that I loved her or that she just wasn't going to graduate with us. I was sorry that it even like happened. I remember people texting me. Okay. So <clears throat> that that's a really emotional one. Um, I can I, unfortunately I can say that my background being an ER nurse and pediatric ER nurse, uh, a trauma nurse, that um, unfortunately I've been in a multitude of similar situations with families and friends. So um, it's not. It, it affects everybody, not just emotionally, but sometimes physically, like the friend being hurt as well, her life changed as well. So what can you do as parents? So you can say, oh my, you know, they're 16, 17, you know, they, they don't know what they want. They don't know what they, they're doing, but they've been watching you for 16 years, 17 years. They've been watching everything you do, your behaviors, your, your driving style, your parenting style, your eating style, whatever, whatever you do as a parent or a guardian, you're, that, that child is watching you. So you can start the discussion. Just constantly talk to them about it. Change your driving habits. Learn our GDL laws. Um, you can go on Nassau County or the state you know, government site and, and look under the DMV laws. Um, and again, just remember driving is a privilege. Uh, so you got to treat it as such. Um, and what teens can do or a driver or a passenger. Uh, you know, always have a plan, uh, speak up. And one of the key things with this program as well is because uh, passengers sometimes are 50% of those that pass away in car crashes. Um, teach them to speak up. Teach your, teach your family, your friends to speak up if you're uncomfortable in the car with somebody who's not driving safely. And um, there is a competition that you can enter. Uh, so hopefully with Oceanside School District this year, we're hoping to maybe uh, work with some of the teachers and uh, get some of the students to enter. So $15,000 prize. So it's pretty cool. Um, but this is uh, my information should you have any questions. And um, I believe that's it. So thank you for taking the time. I guess. Should we take questions? I don't know how much time we have. If anyone has any, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's okay, I'll just, I'm going to end the recording here so you guys can open freely for questions. Hold on one sec.